If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 27. We are winding down Acts chapter 27. We are looking pretty much at the last three or four sermons in the book of Acts. And let me give you the title of the sermon today, Paul the Encourager. Paul the Encourager. Folks, we need encouragement, don't we? I'm telling you, look at the world. You turn on the news and you could get depressed really quick. But let me tell you something, folks. God is in control. All right? Satan, I'm telling you, he's fighting, he's kicking, he's making headway, but he will lose, folks. Our God will prevail, and we praise the Lord for that. The outline today is, number one, he shared God's word with them. Paul shared God's word with them. Number two, he warned them of possible danger. Folks, there's danger out there. There's danger out there, and we thank God uh, for prophets and, and, and men of God that will preach the gospel. And number three, he encouraged them in the faith, encouraged in the faith. Folks, we're all going through storms in life. I don't know anybody that hasn't either going into a storm, in the middle of a storm, or coming out of a storm, okay? Especially with COVID, it's just rampant right now. You don't know what to believe. You really don't. In the worldwide situation, uh, all we can do is pray and believe God and believe God's Word is what we need to do. You know, the storms of life are just going to happen. Uh, some we can avoid by making good decisions. Uh, Jonah is one. He was not thinking when he said, I think I'll run from God. That is not a good thing to do, folks. Uh, we know how that story <laughs> turned out. Uh, he was uh, whale food uh, before it was all over with. Other storms God allows in our lives to make us depend on him more and to trust God more. Paul told them to wait and not go on, but the ship's captain and owner did not listen to Paul. A violent storm had struck them. A white-capped sea, the roar of the wind, the rocking of the ship, the water coming over the deck, and no sun for days and days. They were without hope. And folks, everybody needs hope. Everybody needs hope. The thoughts of drowning even unnerved the most experienced sailors. Paul began this trip to Rome as a prisoner, but his leadership ability came to the forefront in this huge storm in life. Storms don't, storm, a storm doesn't make a person, but it will show what type of person you really are. God used Paul in a mighty way to encourage everyone on the ship and to give them hope in what seemed like a hopeless storm. May we learn to do the same in our storms in life. Acts 27, verse 21. But after a long abstinence from food, and you'll see later on it was two weeks, all right? Folks, I fast some, and I'm telling you, you know, for, for me to go 24 hours someday is a, is a challenge. But, is it, but can you imagine going two, two weeks without food. And there's a lot of questions of why uh, they did that. You know, I think Paul was doing it for spiritual reasons, okay, just personally. And others could have been calling out to their own God, and I want to use little g for the other ones, okay? Some is with the, the storm and all, people were just nervous. They were not thinking about food. They were thinking about life, thinking about surviving. But that's a long time to go without food. Then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me. Huh? I've heard my mother and father tell me that more than once. Son, you should have listened to me. All right, and you know what? They weren't as dumb as I thought they were. They were smart, and I wished I would have listened in a lot of instances. And not have sailed from Crete and incurred, and incurred this disastrous loss. Folks, I'm lost. Folks, I'm telling you, they felt like they were going to die. They were in a desperate situation. They had seen storms before, but this one was different. It was a northeaster. I mean, they left that port, had to go 40 miles. It's all they had to go from fair havens. But yet, God had another plan for them. Verse 22, and now I urge you to take heart. What is take heart? Be strong. Be courageous, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. And he's saying, God t 
told him this. God told him, we're going to lose the ship. There's no doubt about that. But there'll be no loss of life. Folks, a crisis does not make a person, but a crisis shows what a person is made of. Verse 23, And there stood by me this night an angel of, the, of God to whom I belong and to whom I serve. Folks, God sent an angel as the messenger. I have never seen an angel. Never have. I've never talked to an angel. I have never got a verbal message from God. Now God uses the Holy Spirit. I know when God talks to me. There's no doubt in my mind when God is talking to me. If I will just listen. If I will just listen. But Paul is assuring them, by God's Word, by God's messenger, I promise you, you're not going to die. Folks, that should have encouraged them right then and there, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sell with you. What is he saying? Paul is saying what the messenger said. You're only going to live because Paul's on this ship with you. Because God promised Paul he was going to get him to Rome. And if God promises something, folks, he always comes through. Verse 25, therefore, take heart, men. Take heart. Folks, it's a thing of the heart. It's a thing of heart. Talent doesn't always get it. Gifts don't always get it. I want men and women, and even in sports, folks, you give me five guys on a basketball team that have heart, and I'll take it over five all-stars every time. Heart means everything. And we as Christians need to have heart. We should not be afraid. We should not fear. We should know God's in control of all situations in life. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Go with me to Psalm 27. Hold your finger there. and Go to Psalm 27 if you would. Psalm 27, a psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Folks, I respect Satan, but I'm telling you, I'm not afraid of him. I'm not. God is more powerful. He is powerful, but God is almighty. God is more powerful even than Satan. When the wicked come up against me to eat my flesh, when my enemies and foes, they stumbled and they fell, though an army may camp against me. An army, folks, we're not talking about one or two people. We're talking about an army. Look what he says. My heart shall not fear. Shall not fear. Reminds me of Elijah and his young man. They walk out of the tent and they see all these folks, Assyrians, circled around them. And what did Elijah say? Oh, those who are for us are much more than those who are against us. Folks, God is still in the miracle business. My heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this I will be confident. Folks, there's the difference between confidence and arrogance. Arrogance is about you. Okay, arrogance is about you. Confidence is is confident in God. Confident in God. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. What's the, first, what's the worst thing that can happen? Everyone here would say death. But I don't agree with that. To a Christian, death is the best thing that happens to you. See, everybody wants to die to go to, and go to heaven, but nobody, no, everybody wants to go to heaven, but they don't want to die to get there. Folks, it's going to be a perfect place to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me and he shall set me high upon a rock. Oh, it seemed like all things were working against them. The storm, you know, not being in control of the weather and they were throwing and chunking things overboard so that they would uh, go higher and, and be higher in the ocean. 
so that weight wouldn't drag them down. But I'm telling you, Paul said, man, don't be afraid. God's got this. The second thing, not only did Paul share God's word with them, he warned them of possible danger, possible danger. And folks, I'm telling you, sometimes when the pressure is on, okay, when you're in a hopeless situation, people act out. They don't act like they normally would act. All right? Some people are just desperate, desperate. Some people, uh, you know, just, just in their sayings and what they say, they say things that they regret. But I'm telling you, we need to be calm in the storms of life. Paul was a leader. Paul was calm in the storms of life. And if you notice what happened in this first part, he left as a prisoner, and now he was captain of the ship. He was the one in control. God put him in control of what was going on. So look at verse 27. Now when the 14th night had come, as we were driven up and down the Adriatic Sea, and, and again, folks, the storm knocked them 500 miles off course. 500 miles. They weren't sure where they were at. They had not seen the sun in 14 days. It had rained for 14 straight days. I hope you get the picture of what's going on here. About midnight, sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. And again, they could not see it by sight. But again, I think God gives folks discernment. And sailors have been on a sea, and there was just something telling them that they were drawing near. They may even heard the crashing of the waves on the rocks. And they took the soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they took soundings and again found it to be 15 fathoms. And what a fathom is, folks, it's six feet. The way they used to measure it, they would measure it by a man's outstretched arms. And it was around six feet for a fathom. And the soundings that they would do is they would take a weight and put it on a rope. And then they would mark the rope of how many feet there are. And so they would go, let the rope go down and hit, and they would mark that, and then they'd pull the weight up, and it would tell them exactly how deep it is. See, now we have depth finders, we have GPSs, we have all that stuff. But folks, I'm telling you, these were seasoned veterans these were sailors that uh, you know, were sailing a ship that would hold uh, 276 people. But yet they were, they were afraid. They were scared. They had never been in a storm like they were in. Then, verse 29, fearing lest we should run aground on rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for days to come. For day to come. Two things important here. Four anchors, they were wanting to slow the ship down. They were not sure where they were. They were not sure how far shore was away. So they wanted to slow it down so that they would not crash against the rocks at night. And the second thing, they prayed. Now folks, you know, you hear the phrase, cussing like a sailor? All right? Why were they different at this? Because of Paul's influence. They knew something was different about Paul. All right, He didn't panic. He didn't act hopeless. He didn't, he didn't worry about things. He trusted in God. He had faith in the promises of God. And it says, verse 30, and as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, what did they start doing? Some of them start thinking about themselves thinking about themselves and folks we should not do that that's why some folks can't not find joy in their life they cannot find joy in their life because they're always thinking about themselves see joy is putting jesus first jesus first in your life oh is others putting others second in your life and in, in, in why is yourself last? You want to find joy, you apply that to your life. Folks, anybody can be happy. And happiness, a lot of times, depends on circumstances. As long as the wind is blowing softly, as long as the things are going your way, you are happy. 
But folks, true joy comes from our Lord and Savior. So they were seeking to escape when they had let down the skiff into the sea, which is the lifeboat, under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow. So even in the storms of life, there was some a deception going on. Deception. They were sneaking away, trying to save themselves. And folks, that's what the world does. The world doesn't think about others. It's all about me. It's all about my life. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay uh, on the ship, you cannot be saved. See, he gave them a warning. He gave them a warning. He said, and, and he told Julius, hey, I'm just telling you, God has told me, unless they stay on, they will not be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. So we see Paul's influence there. And, and they, they cut the lifeboat away and everyone stayed on the ship. Why was that so important? Because the sailors were the ones that could get them where they needed to be. The, you didn't need the most experienced sailors in a, a life raft drifting away from the ship. You needed every hand on deck. Because he said, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna crash on an island, basically, is what he told them. But our lives will be saved. Isaiah 43. Go to Isaiah 43 with me. Isaiah 43, verse 1. Isaiah 43, 1. The Bible says, but now thus saith the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Oh, folks, the children of Israel had been through so much. They'd been through so much. And I am just telling you, the prophet Isaiah was saying, man, you're a child of God. Man, don't sweat this. Don't fear these things. Don't set up at night worrying about things. Worry, folks, is like a rocking chair. There's a lot of movement, but you are going nowhere. It does not help to worry. You need to turn your worry into prayer and belief and faith and trust in God. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And again, I think it could be the reference to the children of Israel and Moses in the Red Sea. Folks, that is an impossible situation. There's no way anybody could, could move that water back and then walk on dry ground. Folks, our God can do that. He's our God. When it looks like it's, you're going under when it looks like you're going to die, either from drowning or Pharaoh's army. God is there. And though the rivers, they shall not uh, overflow you. All right, The Jordan River could have been. They crossed the Jordan two times, and it was God who, who parted the Jordan River. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Bible says they didn't even smell like fire because of God. Though the flames scorch you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, your Savior. Folks, we're putting our faith in the wrong things. Do not put your faith in man. Put your faith in God. Put your faith in God. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia, Seba, in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Folks, it needs to be good enough that only that, that we know that God loves us. And I know other people love us, but nobody loves us like God loves us. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. And he says it again, fear not, for I am with you. Oh, folks, I am telling you, I'm telling you, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience trusting in God, listening to Paul, all right? Listening to Paul. The third thing I want you to see, not only did he share God's Word with them and warn them of possible danger, and folks, I do believe the Bible 
that if they'd have went in that life raft, those people would have perished. But they didn't because Paul was a man of God and they listened to the voice of God. The third thing I want you to see, he encouraged them in the faith. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food. And again, implored them. It's, it's not one of those, hey, hey guys, why don't you eat? It's one of those, guys, you need to eat. You have not ate in 14 days. And by the way, the best exercise there is, everything that I have ever heard is swimming. Okay, swimming. It is the best cardiovascular, and it's not hard on your knees and feet and all that. But what is he saying? You haven't ate for 14 days, and you're fixing to take a swim. You need strength. You need strength. Paul was looking out for them. Paul was listening to God and giving them good advice. Today is the 14th day, 14th day you have waited and continued without food and ate nothing. Therefore I urge you to take nourishment, for this, this is for your survival. Folks, sometimes we're in that survival mode and we only think of ourselves, but Paul was thinking of them and their health and their strength. And here it is, since, a hair, uh, since not a hair will fall from uh, the head of any of you, you will be saved. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. What did he do? He showed an example. He was a good example. What was he doing? He was blessing the food. Folks, I'm telling you, wherever you go, man, don't be ashamed of Christ. Whatever restaurant you're in, just bow your head and pray and thank God for the meal. You are a testimony to others around them. And when uh, he had broken it, he began to eat. Then, uh, then, then they were encouraged and also took food themselves. And in all, there were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. Because again, folks, they knew they were heading towards land and the lighter the boat was, the higher it would be in the water, which would get them closer to shore. Verse 39, And when it was day, they did not recognize the land. They did not recognize it. They looked around and folks, they were 500 miles in a different direction and even the sailors said, man, I have no idea where we're at. No idea. But they saw land, and that was encouraged to them. But they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And again, when you use the word beach, we're talking sand. Okay, It's much better to land in sand than it is on rocks. Okay, And so they, they started thinking, man, this may work out after all. And they let the anchors go and left them in the sea. Why? The anchors slowed them down. They were wanting to get speed going, all right, speed going and get higher in the water so that they could get as close as they possibly could to shore. And they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where two seas meet, and we know these are reefs, there are reefs out underwater, and you sometimes cannot see the reefs because they are underwater. Uh, striking a place to where they met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow stuck, uh, stuck fast and remained immovable. They went as far as they possibly can, but the stern was broken up by the violent waves. So they had hit rocks. They had hit some sand and stopped, but the, the waves just you know, tore the, the boat uh, apart in the back part of the boat up. In verse 42, and the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners lest any, any of them should swim away and escape. Why would they do that? Some people would say they're just doing their job. They're do, just doing their job. But the deal is, is they didn't want to die. If those prisoners didn't arrive in Rome, those soldiers' lives would have been taken. So even God intervened in that. Even God spared not just Paul's life, but we know earlier that other prisoners had been with him. 
But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first. See, Julius, who he tried to tell before they even started, okay, listen, y'all are making a mistake. There's going to be disaster coming. And he wouldn't listen to Paul, but when it got tough, when the storm of life came, when there was a crisis came, I am telling you, he was listening to everything Paul said. Everything Paul said. And he stopped the executions. He said and told his soldiers, do not touch the prisoners. Everyone head swimming to shore. And I don't know about you, but if I'd have been in that boat, I'd have been one of the first ones out. Man, I'd have been going and, and thanking God that there was some shoreline that I could see. And he commanded him, jump over and to get to the land. And the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship, so obviously the ship was destroyed, and so it was that they all escaped safely to land. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, God prevailed. God used Paul. God performed another miracle. God came through, folks. He does. And do you know the beach that they land on is now? Do you know what the name of that beach is? St. Paul's Bay. Because the story was told over and over again of what had happened. I want to look at Psalm 121. Psalm 121. Please go with me. Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes into the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Folks, I believe in doctors. I believe in medicine. And for the most part, I try to do what they say. There's sometimes I kind of scratch my head and I do my own thing. I, I ain't going to sit here and say I do everything my doctor says. But I believe in an almighty God who is in control of all situations of life. He knows where I'm at. He knows how many hairs are on my head. He knows everything that I think. He knows when I fear. He knows everything about me. And when I need help, folks, we've got to go to God. We've got to depend on God who made heaven and earth. And again, he's just saying, folks, we're not talking about just a God, a little g. We're talking about the God that spoke the world into existence. He knows everything about you. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. God never sleeps. Matter of fact, we talk at 3 in the morning you know, on several occasions when I wake up and can't go back to sleep, we start talking, me and the Lord, and I'm telling you, he's there. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither, neither sleep nor slumber. You can call on him in prayer 24-7, 365 days of the year. He knows your voice. He knows your number. He hadn't lost your number, folks. He is not, not listening to you. I've heard people say in crisis, I don't think God's listening to me. Oh, he's listening to you. He's listening to you, but you have to do it his way, folks. His way. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. All evil. He shall preserve your soul. Folks, he, he created you. He is going to take you all the way through life. And even in death, He is with you. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. You know what He's going to do, folks? He's going to take you home. He's going to take you home. I don't know about you, but there are times in my life, you know, even when I, we do funerals, folks, you know, I, I'm sometimes just almost envious of the person that has died because most of the time they're either older or a disease like cancer or heart trouble, and these things got these folks. But when I think 
And, and, and we have this week, we sit right there and there was a casket right in front of this pulpit as I, as I speak to you, just there. I was just thinking about Miss Pat Smith. She had five things wrong with her. Diabetes was one of those. And I think breathing, COPD was another one. And I thought about getting a glimpse into heaven and seeing her walk through those pearly gates. And God sitting there, Jesus sitting there. Peter, whoever. I know Jim Smith, her husband was waiting. And them embracing just almost makes me envious. But I want to give you as we close seven observations from Paul's leadership. Folks, we as Christians need to be Christian leaders. Okay, I'm not talking about just teachers. I'm, we need to be leaders in life. Okay, people are watching us. People are seeing how we react in situations. They hear what we say. They watch what we do. And we need to be Christian leaders like Paul was in this situation. Number one, a true leader can be trusted. Well, if you know a leader, you can trust them, folks. I, I'm not saying they're perfect. Okay, people make mistakes. But if they have a track record, if they have been doing it a while, you can trust them. Number two, a true leader takes initiative. Initiative. They don't just stand around and wonder what happened. Okay, they, they, they take the initiative. Number three, a true leader uses good judgment. Good judgment. There was some bad judgment on that ship. Bad judgment. And Paul was a good leader. Number four, a true leader speaks with authority. Okay, they're, they're confident. Confident. I'm not talking about arrogant. I'm not saying because I am, and then you fill in the blank. All right, they speak with authority. Number five, a true leader strengthens others. Strengthens others. There's a saying in athletics that says this, that a good player will make the other players better. And folks, the same thing is true in Christianity. A sold-out Christian, a sold-out Christian will make other Christians even better. And number six, a true leader encourages others in the faith. They encourage others in the faith. And the seventh thing, a true leader leads by example. Leads by example. See, true leaders rise to the top in the most difficult situations in life. And we as Christians need to be true leaders in all situations of life. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you that in storms of life, you are here. And God, I don't know the storms of life people are going through right now. But God, I know you know their situation. You know where they are. God, you know the ending. You know what's going to happen. And God, I pray that we would just simply to stay on board, stay on the ship. God, I pray that we would let you guide us. You are our captain. God, I pray that we would pray and depend on you even more. God, I pray that we would keep our eyes on you. God, I pray that we would not feel hopeless or helpless. God, there's no situation. My Bible says with God, all things are possible. I don't really care what a doctor says, and I respect doctors, but I'm saying you can intervene in any situations of life. And God, I pray for those that just seem to be wandering around in the world. God, I pray that they would understand what they need to do is put their faith and trust in you. What they need to do is, is surrender their lives to you. God, I can testify that the greatest decision I made when I was 22 years old was to give my heart and life to Christ, to confess my sin, to repent of my sin, and make you Lord of my life. God, you gave me peace then. I had, I had not had peace in 22 years of living. But God, I thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. And God, if there's those that need to rededicate their lives today or come for baptism or even join the church, God, I pray your Holy Spirit would speak to them this day. God, this is your ship. This is your church. 
This is your life we are talking about. So God, I pray that we would glorify, I pray you in all things, and I pray that we would listen to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?